We have uh, Senator Sinema, who is also joining us remotely. Senator Sinema. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. 22 federally recognized tribes call Arizona home, and I'm proud to work with them closely to be a voice and advocate for Indian country. It's important to me that tribes receive the respect, recognition, and resources owed to them by the federal government. We have a housing shortage throughout Arizona, but the issues that face tribal communities in Arizona are unique, complex, and deserve additional attention and focus. So Ms. Fish, thank you for being here. I've heard from native housing authorities in Arizona about the growing problem of fentanyl and methamphetamine use in their communities, which is a trend we're also seeing in non-native communities. My understanding is that the cost of remediating housing units where drug use has occurred is quite expensive, particularly for smaller tribes. Is this a problem in other parts of the country? And more generally, what can you share with the subcommittee today on this topic? Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, this is a very common problem in Indian country or in tribal communities. And in fact, we spend most of our Indian housing block grant funds in reme re remediating, um, maintaining, and re rehabbing homes than we do in any type of development or new construction of homes. Um, yes. Well, thank you. You know, I've also heard that this is a growing problem and that tribes are using their Indian housing block grant allocations to pay for remediation costs. One tribe in Arizona told me that they're spending around a million dollars per year on remediation activities associated with meth and fentanyl. Now, this worries me for many reasons, but especially because it means that these dollars aren't used towards expanding affordable housing. So, Ms. Fish, is this scenario I just described in Arizona an outlier or is this happening all over? This is happening all over. Hmm. Thank you. I'm working to provide some more attention and funding on this issue to help tribal housing authorities address remediation issues and expand access to affordable housing in Indian country. Switching gears now, I want to touch on the Hearth Act and Indian homeownership briefly. As you all know, the Hearth Act allows for leasing of tribal trust lands in accordance with tribal law without requiring the Interior Department to approve each transaction. I'd like to hear briefly from each of our witnesses today on, more, on why more tribes haven't utilized this law. And are there barriers that we should be aware of that we can assist with? I'm also going to submit this question for the record so that each of you have more opportunity to provide expansive responses. So if you would, in the time that we have together, be somewhat brief. Senator, this is uh, Patrick Goggles, State of Wyoming. Uh, John Barrasso uh, sponsored that legislation, uh, consulted myself on the use of it. Uh, well, on the Wonder River Indian Indian Reservation, we have two tribes, the Northern Arapaho and the East Shoshone, and, and getting the two tribes to agree on a set of regulations that govern each tribe uh, commonly uh, has been difficult to uh, come by. Uh, the Hearth Act uh, allows tribes, or tribe in uh, some cases where there's a single tribe on the reservation, to promulgate regulations under the Hearth Act for leasing. They still have to have the Bureau of Indian Affairs' approval to implement those hard regulations in terms of leasing of uh, individual home sites or subdivisions in their area, which includes um, rights of ways, easements, uh, road easements, and utility rights of ways. In my case, I use a uh, utility uh, license agreement with the Northern Arapaho tribe um, in place of the Heart Act right now to get that job done and streamline that process. Senator, um, I, I would ag agree that um, there are different, I always refer to what we do on a daily basis as a big jigsaw puzzle. Each community has you know, their own set of um, pieces. And just like you mentioned there, um, not utilizing the hearth program and utilizing another program that fits. That's really what we do on a daily basis is we, we look for what fits for our community and what, uh, what is gonna be streamlined and probably the quickest and the fastest and that what we're most comfortable with. In native CDFIs, whether it comes to funding, you know, not every native CDFI probably can use the 502, but they might be able to use other programs. So we're constantly looking for different pieces to make it work in our communities. Each community is a little bit different. Last week I spent a week up in South Dakota with the South Dakota Native Home Ownership Coalition. There were about eight native CDFIs in the room and they introduced the new Freddie um, Mac program and only maybe two of them said it could work for them. 
But I said, but that's a positive thing because that piece that fits your puzzle. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the short answer is that it's difficult and very challenging for tribes to, so the tribes work with the BIA's uh, realty office uh, to be able to exercise the Hearth Act to get, and that realty office is challenged with getting tribes ready to take over leasing. And they need the local capacity to take over. So really it is a capacity issue within tribes themselves and also within the BIA. So that component of the process is so overwhelming that tribes are discouraged from being able to exercise it. Thank you, Senator Sinema.